Well, welcome everybody um, to um, you know the uh, meeting of the uh, Society for the New Humanist Paradigm. Um, it's Saturday, April 21st, it's just after 7, so we're starting relatively on time. Tonight, uh, Paul and I are going to talk to you about a bunch of different things, but I'd like to talk to you about what's been going on in Syria and the world situation a little bit, and some of the attitudes of people in general in my own family and other places as well. And um, the recent attacks on the city of Damascus by USA, UK, and France um, are disturbing, to say the least. And a lot of what you're hearing out there is, you know, oh, it's really nothing, and it's no big problem, and nothing's going to happen, and it's okay, and, you know, whatever. They just fired 114 missiles, and, you know, it's not a big deal. That is incorrect. And that is a real callous, sort of laissez-faire, sort of, you know, approach to what's going on in these countries that are being attacked and bombed. And there's a, there's a certain reality on the ground, and there's a certain reality to activism with us as activists that we need to understand and be compassionate about that kind of thing. And, you know, don't get don't get this real, uh, you know, sort of uh, callous attitude, hard-nosed attitude, where uh, it's no big deal, it's just war, it's just bombs, whatever, you know. In some other countries, it's not affecting you. The city of Damascus was attacked, and 114 missiles were fired, of which, as near as we can tell, the Syrian air defense shot down 71 of those missiles, and the rest <coughs> landed or hit their targets or, some, you know, went to the ground. Um, something you may not know about the city of Damascus and about Syria in general is the city of Damascus is the oldest and longest it, it's had people living in it it's the oldest city in the world and has the, the, the longest continual um, amount of, you know, with people living in it for the longest time so in other words in the world this city has had somebody living there continuously for the longest amount of time it's incredible and then if you look at a lot of these other cities that are there, in that whole area, Aleppo and Homs, all these places, they are very ancient cities. They go back 12 and 13,000 years. This is not just uh, you know, a new civilization. These are old civilizations that have been around for a long, long time. And we can learn a lot from them, you know? So, you know, Syria has many ancient cities and a lot to offer in terms of civilization in general. Um, what I'd like to show you first, first is some drone footage. What is, can you get the drone footage yeah. of what cities are, are being bombed? What it kind of looks like to give you an idea? Because I think here in the West we don't really understand what it means when a cruise missile lands, or a 500-pound bomb lands, or a thousand-pound bomb. You know, and and we, my good friend Mike, made a good point. Here in Vancouver, a lot of us live in wood-structured homes, but they live in mostly concrete-type homes. Imagine these th same weapons coming down in amongst wood structures and, and you know, stuff like that. It would be very destructive, right? So you have to kind of imagine it that way. Yes, please. So just tee that up. This is East Aleppo. Drone footage. There's hardly a building here that hasn't been struck, or damaged, or is unlivable. And they're all made of concrete. Second largest city in Syria. Was the first? Damascus. Was the first? Damascus. No, that was the biggest one. Yeah. Before this. Yes. It was, yes. Now it's Damascus. Yeah. It's an industry area. Made industrial stuff. Yeah. Stuff. 
solid drag. Almost every city in Syria, the largest cities, have had similar damage done to them. Wonder why we have um, refugees. It's just about down here. Yes. Yeah. So. You can see those big gaps in the roofs and stuff like that where bombs go through, like here, right? It's gone right through down to the inside and detonated, right? And then I think we've got some for before and after pictures too. Yeah. So those are uh, drones dropping bombs, also from the CWW. These are cruise missiles and planes dropping bombs as well. But artillery does the same on, thing. From both sides, right? From Syrian government and the Allies. Fighting with the, fighting with the um, rebels. The rebels yeah. Yes. Yeah. The other thing you need to think about is, imagine the infrastructure or the supply that it takes to keep a rebel army in the field. You need weapons, you need yeah. food, you need intelligence. Mm -hmm. You need all of these things to continually fight like this. Where are they getting it? Yeah. Where is it coming from? You have to ask yourself. Yeah. Here's is, some of the before and after. This is the same, you can see the same here, yeah. square. This is after. You can see some of the. Yeah. Wow. Gives you it gives you a sense of it anyway. Yeah. That's, yeah. Same city square, and then again. I like. <laughs> Oh, there are nothing left. <laughs> That's the nothing really left. There. Even the trees are gone. And yeah, even the trees are gone. Yeah, you can see it was a big row of trees, and yeah, yeah. beautiful place, right? Okay, so we're gonna. I think we're gonna move on here. Right? Yeah. So I would ask that none of you ever be dismissive when you hear about cruise missiles or bombs falling or drones, you know, being used on people. It's not. There's a huge trauma and long-term damage being done here to the citizens and to the people, kids that are being raised and people that live in these places. Imagine this, these bombs are, are, draw, are um, you know, drones or you know, missiles landing in your city or your town. I don't think you'd really appreciate it. The next thing is, the night that the attack started is Tom Dugan, a reporter, a British reporter who lives most of his life in Damascus was there. And he wakes up to the missiles are starting to fall in Damascus. And mm -hmm. sorry, yeah. Go ahead, punch it up. Yeah. I've just been woke up in bed by rockets flying over. Real time, all the rounds. Um, this is Damascus at four o'clock in the morning. Um, I believe the United States of America is just in that city. What you can hear is anti aircraft guns going off. It's pretty crazy, this. It's the last thing we needed. The last thing on this planet we needed. There was a missile that's in the missile. Yeah. 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 Thank you, America. Thank you very, very much. Donald Trump, sir, you're an idiot. You're an absolute idiot. The part of the reason I, sh I showed you this is that you can clearly see how disturbed this man is and how this is affecting him, what's happening. So imagine if you lived in an area or whatever, and it doesn't matter what his personal feelings are or what he's saying so much as it does is how he feels about what's happening, right? And so, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's disturbing to people when you're actually on the ground and you see this kind of thing happening. And what a lot of people don't know is when those missiles go up and intercept another one coming in, that wreckage comes down somewhere. There's an explosion, goes up, explodes, both, both missiles, or if they miss, they land somewhere else, right? And they go up. So it's not like as if they just disappear because you fired the missile. They're kind of going to come down somewhere. So you need to remember that. So, you know, that's the point I'd like to make is this, here's a guy that's very clearly upset and very disturbed at what's going on. So imagine how you'd be if you lived in these areas. Um, just like to show you what it's like when they're firing cruise missiles. And on to get, get the 114 of these were fired into Damascus. Almost two million dollars profit. They need 55 million dollars to fix the water problem in Flint, Michigan. They spent almost two hundred million dollars, well over two hundred million dollars, on firing these missiles, here. but they haven't got the money to do it. How much per bomb? About almost two million, one point seven million dollars per cruise missile. So imagine that Flint, Michigan can't you can't spend fifty five million dollars on fixing the water, but you can you have no problem firing these off. Uh, now I just want to show them the use of cluster bombs. Most people don't know what cluster bombs are. They're a thousand pound bomb with one thousand one pound round circular bombs. As the bomb comes in, the front half opens and it dumps out all the one pound bombs and they run and they fly everywhere. Fifty percent of them go off when they hit. Twenty-five percent are on time delay, three minutes, up to three minutes. The other twenty-five percent are on a detonator switch. If a child picks it up or you kick it with your foot or you accidentally disturb it, boom, it goes off later. So there's, there's that trauma that builds on top of that. So you think the attack's over and we can come out now, everything's okay. That's not the case. Very traumatizing, very huge damage. So you can see that this is, this is a Russian attack. You can see how widespread the attack when it takes place. That's probably five or six city blocks being covered in one, in one goal. That's the Russian bombing. Yeah, I mean, that's the Russian yeah, well. Populations and very destructive to light cars, buses, light armored vehicles. They use each one is compressed with ball bearings, steel ball bearings that come out at thousands of miles an hour or feet per second. And the next thing is That's an eight by eight CD block. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. And what was the reason for the Russians? Dropping? They're attacking rebel forces that are entrenched yeah. in. In the city here, how and they're fighting house to house. How uh, current? This is relatively current. Aleppo was not that long ago. This, this was this was 2016. 2016, yeah. yeah. March. Be good to get the report and to get uh, footage of Raqqa as well. The Americans let that one go. There's almost nothing. Left. And nothing left of Raqqa. No, that's correct. Raqqa is way worse of all the cities. And now phosphorus bombs, which are really against the Geneva Convention. I want to show you how they work. Just before you, oh, oh you go ahead, I'll, I'll talk after you show it. I'll take a look at this video from this TV smoking white residue. It's going up the air when it says, say, it is white phosphorus. But to give you an idea of what white phosphorus is, it is an offensive weapon that's self igniting, it burns quickly, and produces an immediate smoke screen. Which is, of course, well, yes. It is banned in densely populated civilian areas by the Geneva Conventions. The reason why is because the impact is notably catastrophic to the human body. It causes skin to melt away from the bone. The New York Times cited an unnamed U.S. official who confirmed that American forces do have access to white phosphorus, but the official insists it's not being deployed against civilians. U.S. Army Colonel Ryan Dillon tells the Washington Post that the U.S. military uses white phosphorus in accordance with the law of armed conflict. Well, he also added, the U.S.-led coalition takes all reasonable precautions to minimize the risk of incidental injury to the... 
Israel is using that in Gaza as well. Israel uses white phosphorus in Gaza quite often. I don't think you didn't know about phosphorus, but it's an interesting chemical. It has its own oxygen molecule locked in. If you, you can't put it out with water, you can't put it out with a fire extinguisher, if it gets on you, that's it. It stays there and it burns right through. Okay, so there's no way to st stop it from doing the damage that it's going to do once it's on you. That's it. And that's why it's in, by Geneva Convention that you're not supposed to use it on civilian populations, anything like that. I mean, there's some horrific pictures, if you want to look them up, I'm not going to put you through that of what it does to human bodies. It's terrible. So the last thing we're going to look at is uh, Hellfire missiles. By the way, the Americans have just built their second factory because they couldn't keep up with the amount of missiles they were using in their Hellfire, in their drone programs. So they built a second factory to build the Hellfire 2 to keep up with the number of missiles they're using in drone strikes, Hellfire missiles. Go ahead. So this is a drone, Predator drone. It's looking, looking for a target. Military intelligence, which is not very intelligent, by the way. Oh, it's just. These are the gun sights on the camera. There's six different people running the drone. All young guys that are experienced on, uh, I, on the, um, the different games. That's the guys that like to pick, 18 to 25 year olds, that are expert playing the games. The military has worked with the uh, drone people so the controls are the same. So that you can get a kid in there at 18 or 20 and teach them how to run one of these drone systems. Multiple kids running the same system. Somebody on the roof here, see? Can't see anything. Yeah, boom. There was a camera on that on that missile went right in, right? There you go. I didn't even notice that. So Chelsea Manning. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Chelsea Manning was the uh, soldier, American soldier, that gave up the gun camera footage of all the, just the mistakes that were made by drones, showing all of the deaths and casualties by drone missiles fired, and then find out later, yeah, that was a wedding, sorry, cloud of damage. Yeah, no, that was a get together of a bunch of students having a, a meeting, that, sorry, too bad, our intelligence wasn't good. Oh, we were tracking a cell phone, and the uncle had given the teenage son the cell phone, he went to some of his friends, we tracked the cell phone signal down and fired the cell fire missile down there. Sorry, it's just glad I'm down to you up there. No, don't worry about it. No big deal. So anyway, they sent Chelsea to prison. He, he did seven years and they finally let him out. Um, he was transgender and that was the issue. It wasn't, it, the issue became he's transgender and he's trying to cost the Americans you know, money to change, pay for his change, transgender change. Not the fact that they're using drone strikes which were illegal by international law and by national law, and then you know a lot of the um, the uh, assassinations that are taking place are illegal as well, including no American citizen. That's the story. Okay, um, so that gives you an idea of what that looks like. I just want to tell you one thing about uh, Hellfire missile drone strike. It has a very peculiar signature, and you may always find pieces of the body, and sometimes you don't even find them but you always find a pile of skin, a large amount of skin. That's what's left after a Hellfire drone spray, especially with the Hellfire drone. You can put it in a shoebox about that big. So that's what they go there with, a the shoebox, put it in and they bury it. So they had something to bury, right? Why do they hate us? Why do they not like us? God, what's wrong here? Anyway, <laughs> okay, um, and then we're gonna to go to Yemen. What's going on in Yemen right now, just stop for a second, um, is absolutely horrendous. The Saudis are, are bombing the, the um, Houthi rebels continuously and attacking Yemen continuously. There's thousands of deaths that are taking place, and that's happening in real time. And they're using all of these things, cluster bombs, phosphorus, the whole nine yards. <clears throat> they're being supplied primarily by the UK and the US. 
the Americans are supplying the fuel tankers that are flying 24-7 to fuel the um, Saudi jets that are flying over Yemen. So the American planes fly in, fuel the planes, and they can continue with their bomb sets. Without the tankers and without the resupply of weapons, which the UK and the um, US are pouring in, into Saudi Arabia, they could not continue the war. And the Houthis are making certain, they keep firing missiles, they drag all the parts close to Riyadh or to one of the cities in, in um, Saudi Arabia and will fire a missile into the town just to say, or into the city to say, you know, we're still here, we're still fighting, right? So, um, this is a low op or a daisy cutter fuel air bomb. There has been some talk about the using neutron bombs. If you look at the size of these explosions, they are single, they're the single largest non conventional bomb you can use in the world. They're using dozens of these in Yemen. shakes the camera and does everything crazy. The signature for a nuclear weapon is in this cloud, if and when you ever witness an explosion like that and you see lightning in that cloud, that is a nuclear weapon. If you don't see lightning in the cloud, the Martian cloud, that's not a nuclear weapon. That's a conventional weapon. That's how you differentiate when you see these things from a distance. Just tactical, to keep them. Tactical, 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 tactical nuke. Tactical nuke, yes. They're uh, regular radioactive as does have any other nuclear weapon, aren't they? Well, they've been accused of using tactical nukes a few times. I just haven't seen the lightning cloud yet. There was one in Damascus where I did see the lightning cloud. That was by the Israelis back about five years ago. But you look at the size of that explosion. Right. This is in Yemen. Yeah. These are all in Yemen. Yeah, there's one right after the other in Yemen they're being used. And they're being given to the Saudis as well, to by the uh, Americans in the UK, US and UK. I mean, you don't just build those things. So they're, they're a weapon. Anyway, I think we're going to move on here. I have an interesting story for you. I'm going to put this all together and we're going to wrap it up. Um, I'm going to show you a map of Syria and Israel. And we're going to talk about oligarchs and, and power elites and royals and how it all fits together. This is the Golan Heights. That's Israel and this is Syria. The Golan Heights were taken from, Israel, from Syria in the Six Day War. Never been given back. Okay? They just have claimed them as part of what uh, they say they won that war, therefore they get to keep the Golan Heights. The Syrians have never ever at the UN or anywhere else signed off the Golan Heights. And they continue to lay claim to the Golan Heights and say they're rightfully theirs. And they say they're not going to back off of that. Okay? So, this is what the Golan Heights looks like. This is what it looks like. It's beautiful. That's about half of the Israeli occupation, right? That's yes, it's all occupied by the Israelis. It's the height of land between Israel and Syria. It's the higher, it's called the Golan Heights. It's like a, a raised up plateau. You know. Um, but what's interesting about the Golan Heights is some of your favorite characters are now in the Golan Heights. A company called Genie Oil has the rights to drill for oil in the Golan Heights. Genie, Genie Oil is what they're called. Dick Cheney. And who, thank you very much. Dick Cheney heads up Genie Oil. Rothschilds is the second guy to Genie Oil. And then the who's who of everybody that you hate oligarchs and, and royalty are here and they're drilling for oil and gas. There's huge oil and gas deposits in the Golan Heights. This is what's going on. It's one of the things that's going on. Right? It also gives, the Israelis say it gives them a buffer zone against Syria. The country they fear most of all militarily is Syria. In the Six Day War, the Syrians took it to them. They had beaten the Israeli army, they were on the Golan Heights, made one mistake. They stopped on the Golan Heights to refuel and reset. A lot of their commanders said, let's go, let's drive right into Israel. Let's push them into the sea. In that day that they stopped to refuel, 
American aircraft carriers pulled up. They seconded pilots, weapons, aircraft, everything to the Israeli Army and Air Force and took to the Syrians on the Golan Heights and defeated them. Without that aid, that would have never happened. That's never forgotten or forgiven in the Middle East. Why do they hate us? Okay. The very core of royal power, of power elites, of the oligarchy, is money and finance. That is the core of their empire. Money and finance. That's how they, that's how they use, use it to for power and control. Invariably certain characteristics, as you well know, are in these people. Psychotic, sociopathic, narcissistic. That's who the oligarchs are, that's who the royals are, that's who the power elites are. And they need that power base, which is finance and money. That's how the true power, their true power comes from. And when they welded in the 1600s the oligarchs to the power to banks, it was the perfect storm. Okay? That is the core of their power. You, you took the oligarchs, the royals, and the six families of Europe, and you welded them to the banks. Now they have real power. Psychotic power, narcissistic power, sociopathic power. They're, they seek and have maintained power for centuries through the control of money and finance. Okay? They use their control over the banks, private and public, to achieve their ultimate goal, which is power and control of humanity on a global scale. That is the core of their empire. From out of that comes everything else. Okay? That's really key for you to understand. And this is how they do what they do so well. So, <coughs> you need to think about that. The thing that I'd like to leave you with is that, as activists, we need to think about this, and we need not to be, you know, dismissive, or like I said, callous, or not caring about things like this going on. This will affect us. If you think there's not blowback from this kind of stuff, you're sadly mistaken. You're sadly mistaken. It's generational when they start doing this kind of stuff, right? So that's the kind of stuff we've got to fight against to deal with. And then, of course, I like the, uh, there's an old Chinese saying, it's a Chinese curse. It says, may you live in interesting times. And indeed, we do live in interesting times, people. It's here. So that's the Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. We're living in interesting times. So anyway, that's all I've got to for today. Any questions? None of the <laughs> a, a lot of a lot of pretty serious faces out there. <laughs> not, 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 none of the media guys talked about uh, what's happening in Yemen. They always talk 24 hours on Syria. Yes, they don't even mention Yemen. That's right. Very good point. And uh, uh, cholera outbreaks, and the blockade. You know, they have disease happening, starvation, starvation happening. Um, some gas. Yeah, happening. huge, horrendous. It's a cataclysmic type um, apocalyptic situation taking place in Yemen. And the Western media, the much vaunted Western media, always tells us the truth. They got nothing to say about it. They're just, they, they don't, you know, they're not really talking about that. It doesn't matter which the conservative, left, right, center, nobody talks about it. Nobody, yeah, it doesn't seem like anybody wants to talk about it. Go ahead, uh, Stu. Yeah, this one here, that's a new one. It's uh, US. Essentially, low under seconded uh, aircraft to Israel to fight Syria in six day war. Yep. And these were carrier based aircraft? Yes. Yes. They, they, some were flown in, some were, were, you know, they fold their wings and move them up by ship, by transport ship to the, to, um, the, um, so they were operating out of Israel airport. Yeah, so they were operating out of Israel airports. They didn't fly them off. The carriers only took, they landed at Israeli bases and first. Them. And then, put the new stickers on, refueled them, you swear to be part of Israel, fight for Israel, yes. You're, you're an Israeli citizen now, yes. Here's papers, get in plain gold, right? So, I don't know if you've seen that movie, uh, uh, Law of the Liberty, where the Israelis attacked them. Yeah, Liberty, the USS Liberty? Yeah. Yes, because they were monitoring what was going on in... They were, they were down in the Sinai, right? Yes. Uh, and this 
that's a very that's uh, made by an American who's very critical of the policy, the oldest rate approach there. But they said at that time that they moved the six fleet back to Creek, which is about 300 miles away. That's just a hop for a jet plane. No, no, I understand. Yeah. That's just a stole whole burger. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I'm not saying they were flying them off the carrier decks or the Americans were, they were indirectly helping by. Sometimes if people haven't seen that, they should go and pick up that movie or get that movie, Loss of Liberty. Also, there's a movie. Loss of Liberty. Loss of Liberty. Robbie, you forgot to show the Saker article. I got it at Kevin in. Where's Saker article? It's one that's relevant to this. The one about the carrier? Oh, no. Uh, no. The one about, um, we have an article that the Saker did that Mark Hanno reported to us and sent us the links. And it, all you should take a look at it. It clearly shows how close we were to a flat out confrontation and indicates what was going on between Russia and the U.S. and, and oh. how, how iffy it was. You know, and um, how close we came to an all out. And all war. So I mean, uh, and that's just like four or five days ago. I mean, we're <laughs> we're living in interesting times. So um, she's just going to punch it up. Here it is. Here, this is, this article is well worth reading. Sorry, it's um. Uh, yeah, you got both. So the arrows. There you go. <clears throat> there it is. Each click brings us one step closer to the bank. This is the sacred of South Yes. 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 Okay. And the last paragraph is very interesting. Yes. We, the people who this time around succeeded in foiling the neocons' plan for a real hard strike in Syria, and possibly even the Russian passport Syria, succeed the next time. Uh, that's well. Okay. I don't know, but I think cannot ignore the fact that each click brings us one step closer to the bank, and that suggests to me that the only real solution to this extremely dangerous situation is to find your mind a, a way to move the finger, pressing on the trigger, or better, take away the gun from the nutcase threatening us all with it. Well, there's many nutcases threatening us, not just one. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's what I want to say. If you want to look up that article and read it, it's well worth reading. Thanks for that. Okay. There are lots of good articles. <laughs> yes, there are. Any other questions? Sometimes you can show a loss of liberty. Okay, we'll sit down and do that. Yeah. We're going to show loss of liberty at some point. We'll all watch it. Yeah. And our uh, mind was going to be deeper. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As always. <laughs> uh, have you read the uh, the letter by 